Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the first annual Green Rights and Warrior Lawyers Virtual Academy. My name is Stephen Wood. I'm with the Center for Law and the Environment at the University of British Columbia on unceded Musqueam territory in Vancouver, Canada. Very sorry for the late start. Uh, we encountered technical issues that we have now resolved and we are ready to go, but I will compress my opening remarks to be as brief as possible so that we don't uh, lose too much time. Um, in this session of the Academy, we are joined by Marian Min from uh, Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, she's the executive director of the Agenda Foundation. Uh, I'm going to introduce our commentator, Avi Lewis, who is going to introduce Marian. Um, everybody, please introduce yourself in the chat, and if you're comfortable, turn your video on so that we can have a more um, interactive experience. Avery, if you wouldn't mind just stopping sharing that screen for a moment and people will be able to see me. Um, the session is being recorded. It will be available on our website and YouTube channel. Um, and I just wanted to also say that uh, contrary to what we advertised in advance, when we're done the formal part of this talk, we will stay in this Zoom session for an informal chat around the virtual kitchen table with Marianne and Avi. Um, so those of you who had signed up in advance to go to the separate uh, uh, sort of virtual kitchen table Zoom room, uh, you don't need to do that. We'll stay in this room. It's a small enough group that we can just uh, stay together uh, in the same space. Um, I'm going to give a very brief introduction to uh, my colleague Avi Lewis uh, here at UBC. Uh, and I will uh, refer folks to the biographical sketch that is on the uh, Academy uh, event website for further details. Avi is well known to many Canadians as a leading documentary filmmaker and journalist uh, with more than 30 years of experience in journalism and storytelling on the front lines of social movements. We're very uh, lucky that he has recently joined uh, UBC in the Department of Geography, where he's a professor and also associated with the brand new UBC Center for Climate Justice. And with that, I will just say um, welcome, Avi. Thank you for joining us. And I will hand over to Avi, who will introduce our uh, main speaker, Marianne Minesma. Avi. Thanks, Stefan. Good, good morning, afternoon, and evening to all of you in different time zones. Uh, I'm here in uh, Huel Kwai, otherwise known as Half Moon Bay, in the Shishal territory, unceded Shishal territory on the Sunshine Coast of so-called British Columbia. Um, and I'm really delighted to, to be here today. And it, frankly, it's been a pleasure to get to learn more about our awesome speaker who has been afflicted by Zoom uh, this evening for her. Uh, but we are together now, and I can't wait for, for this session to start. Um, it's a real honor for me to introduce Marian Minesma. Uh, in, I'll start with the most recent phase of Marian's long career. Uh, in 2007, Marian co-founded the Agenda Foundation. And to save her a little bit of, of the work, I will tell you a little bit about it. Um, Urgenda works on developing and fighting for, and frankly, implementing climate solutions in the Netherlands. Uh, and one of the things that I love about this organization is that it's really always been focused on concrete change. Uh, from, I think it was 2008, when Urgenda played a key role in getting the electric vehicle market jump-started in the Netherlands by importing the first mass-produced electric vehicles from Norway, uh, organized the first collective buying program for solar panels in 2010. But really, Urgenda is most famous globally as an organization of green legal warriors. And that's because in 2012, the foundation launched this groundbreaking climate lawsuit against the Dutch government based on what was then a novel legal argument of the duty of care that a government has to its citizens. It was a landmark suit that attempted to make the government's climate action obligations legally binding. Uh, and as someone who lives in uh, in Canada, it would be pretty awesome if our government was under the same legal obligation to actually implement all of its beautiful uh, uh, words and commitments and actually uh, make them uh, shift uh, dramatically in favor of climate action. Unfortunately, we live in the 
in the um, uh, in the cognitive dissonance of hearing one thing and 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 seeing the status quo march on as as we do globally. Uh, but that's not quite the same dynamic in the Netherlands, in large part because of the work of Mariana and Argenda. This lawsuit wound its way through the courts, winning uh, various victories at different uh, levels of the court. Uh, but I think importantly, Marion used that uh, case as an organizing tool, uh, innovating this approach called crowd pleading, which sort of mixes crowdfunding and citizen science and involving the public in developing the, the legal case and the campaign alongside it. And people in the Netherlands submitted their reasons why citizens have the right to be protected from climate change. And ultimately, almost 900 people joined the suit as co-plaintiffs, uh, I think showing a, an instructive example of how a legal uh, front can also be a social movement organizing tool, uh, a very important lesson for me in this case. So then in 2019, the Supreme Court of the Netherlands upheld these previous rulings in favor of the suit and ordered the Dutch government to act immediately to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 25% below 1990 levels by the very next year at that point, 2020. So this was a global first, citizens winning legally binding accountability from their government for failing to protect them from the impacts of the climate crisis. Uh, and one of the things said about the case uh, that stood out for me, as well as a quote from the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, which I, I won't read you, but Michael Gerard of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia called the case, quote, the strongest decision ever issued by any court in the world on climate change, and the only one that has actually ordered reductions in greenhouse gas emissions based on constitutional grounds. And so uh, the uh, alongside developing the case, Urgenda had led this coalition of 800 uh, Dutch NGOs and businesses on an actual plan with dozens of concrete policies for the government to implement. The government implemented many of them, including cl uh, closing two coal-fired power plants. I remember in 2010, uh, I don't know if you were at Greenpeace at that time, Marjan, but uh, Greenpeace, the Netherlands, projected a film that I directed, This Changes Everything, a partner project to my partner Naomi Klein's great book of the same name, uh, projected the documentary on the side of a coal-fired power, coal power plant in the Netherlands as one of the many direct actions leading up to the closing of that plant, and it was in the end closed. And of course, we've seen ripples from the uh, unique legal victory in the Netherlands around the world, uh, where, where there are now hundreds of similar suits in different countries. So activists and warrior uh, lawyers around the world know that these cases can win, and perhaps more importantly, that these cases can mobilize public opinion can help organize around holistic and concrete climate solutions and build the power necessary to win transformative change. So it is my honor to introduce to you today, a Goldman Prize winner and true legal warrior, Marianne Medesma. Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, that was one of the nicest introductions I've ever had, so thanks. I'm going to try to share my screen and see whether that works at once or not. Um, can you see something already? Indeed. And we do got you it. see a full, a full screen or not? A full screen. And we can see your previous slides on the side. And it's all very Dutch as well, which I think, you know, it's, it's kind of your thing. So, well, only the first thing is Dutch. <laughs> That's okay. Do you now still see the things on the side or not? Yeah, we're still seeing the side things. Okay. Is that a problem? I don't mind. Okay. Yeah. Well, Nobody here minds. We're just happy to have you. Uh, start. Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I will tell things later about our court case, but just maybe start um, with last year. Um, we won this court case. So I um, asked our prime minister, well, we started the court case in 2012. We finally won it by the very end of 2019. And I have never met you in person. And I asked him with a letter, please, um, let's have a meeting together. And uh, I would like to give you a small lecture about climate change. And he uh, agreed on that. So we were with only four people in the room. I had my sh my slideshow. He was sitting one meter from me. And this was my first slide, only not with the picture of himself on it. But for the rest, it was this was my first slide. And I asked him, we start with emitting uh, greenhouse gases by using oil, coal and gas the last 270 years, but what percentage of all emissions do you think happened during your life? And he and I are a few months apart in age, so his figure is my figure. 
Uh, and he was looking at me like, oh dear, I have to uh, give a good answer. And he was like, well, if it would be linear, then it would be 15%. That's probably not good. And he was looking at me <laughs> and I say, no, that's not good. And then he said, well, I think 30%. Um, and then I had to tell him that that was awfully wrong because uh, he is around 55, so almost 80% of all emissions were due during his life and during my life. And I started with those two slides because I wanted to tell him, look, our generation have caused the problem. We have emitted during our lifetime most of the greenhouse gases. So I think we have to find the solutions. And it's too easy to look at young people and say, oh, you're my hope, or you're going to do innovations or all those stupid things. No, I said, you're the leading man in our country for 10 years now. So you and I are the ones that should make sure that we now reduce the greenhouse gases within 10 years um, to almost zero. That's the only way out if you really take uh, Paris seriously. And I told him, um, I wanted to give this slideshow because I hear you saying in the news all kinds of things on TV like um, uh, be calm, we have another 30 years, are you still able to barbecue, no problem. And I told him, no, you don't have 30 years and you should not be calm, you should be in a crisis mode. So I started uh, to give him a small lecture about climate change because I heard him saying too many things that were not true. And I, at least I wanted to say, be able to say in future, you know the real truth. So if you're now saying this, then you're lying. Uh, and now he could still say, I didn't know it. So my first uh, basic sheet was what I do if I give lectures to um, young people that know, do not know much about climate change is this slide that shows in 800,000 years the, uh, the uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been between 180 and 280 CO2 particles within a million particles in the air. And that normally every 100,000 years, we go to another ice age and we should be going to the next ice age. And instead of that, we are moving up uh, with an incredible pace. And the last time we were here uh, with this concentration was more than 3 million years ago. And that was not a very nice atmosphere for us as humans. And the sea level was 30 meters higher and it's not just not what you want. So I explained to him that there is a difference between the concentration and the emissions. Because what I see is that a lot of politicians mix the two. They think if the emissions are zero in 2050, it's fine. But I explained to him that CO2 stays there for hundreds of years and it's about as quickly as possible to go down. And not it's not about the end thing in 2050. You can see that, that it needed time for him to get to grip with all those things and that emissions is not the main thing but concentration is the main thing and I think a lot of politicians do not really uh, really know this I explained to him well our court case has been won because there is going to be a very dangerous situation already this century if you don't act and one of the examples that we used uh, in the courts, because you have to show this dangerous situation, is in the Netherlands, um, we have a country with one third of the country laying below sea level and half of the country have serious problems if the sea level is rising. So we had an official uh, committee of the government in 2008, which had to look for the government, what do we need to invest in building our dikes for the next hundred years? I think we're the only country in the world that invests hundred years up front. And this committee with all kinds of professors uh, had as his worst case scenario for this century that the sea level rise would be one meter and 30 centimeters. Uh, and therefore we now spend 1 billion a year on improving our dikes. Uh, and we had a, a chairman as agenda that was Professor Fellinga, and he was part of this committee. And he told me when this um, report came out that a lot of people were very angry at this committee because they said one meter 30, that's exaggerating, that can't be true, and you are activists and so on. Whereas this whole committee was consisting of all kinds of professors. So they were really very worried that the, the, the reaction was so fierce. And the funny thing between brackets is that we're 10 years later, the worst case scenario had already transferred to two and a half to three meters this century. 
And of course, it's a worst case scenario. You don't, you hope you don't have the worst case scenario. But the thing is that it moved from one meter 30 to two and a half and three within 10 years. And that should worry us enormously because we, we had a big, um, um, a, a, a big problem in the early 50s when we had an enormous uh, dike break and we had hundreds of dead people and it took us more than 30 years before we had the dikes at the level that were good and all those dikes are made for 50 centimeters well i'm quite sure that we will be having more sea level rise than 50 centimeters and if it takes another 30 to 40 years to build higher dikes we might not even be in time and that's what a lot of people don't realize that in the Netherlands, uh, more and more scientists are, are worried and say, maybe we should start to talk to our neighboring country, which is Germany. Uh, and maybe in future, we can't stay in the Netherlands. Well, 10 years ago, if you would say that you would be declared mad. And nowadays it's in the newspapers. So a lot's changed within 10 years. And that shows you how quickly things go. But for us, this worry was one of the reasons why we started the court case. And we have a kind of think tank, and there was a lawyer in the think tank that wrote this book, Revolution Justified, and I read it. Uh, and one of my backgrounds is environmental law. And I thought, well, I, I think we should try it. So we started already in 2012. Oh, something went wrong. Yunk. Uh, probably you know James Hansen at that time still at NASA. Uh, this is the, the lawyer and this was prof Professor Rotmans and myself. And we started in 2012 to warn our government, you should do more and you should live up to your own promises, goals and so on. That's the same as in Canada, a lot of nice promises, but not acting. And uh, we told the government, well, you said in all kinds of documents that you need to do between 25 and 40 percent reduction in 2020 and your current goals are only 17 percent whereas your minimum your own declared minimum is 25 so please stop it up and preferably to 40 percent and then we received a message uh, uh, we agree fully with you that is a main a big problem climate change but we don't want to be a front runner which is really funny if you know that at that time we were one of the laggards in Europe. But at least when you um, have tried to have a dialogue, then thereafter you can go to court. So that was what we did. And in court, of course, the lawyers of the government said, well, we are a very small country, so we can't change the climate change problem. So dear judge, don't say anything because we are not able to do anything about it. And I think it's good to realize that if you look at all countries in the world, we as a very small country, we are here. This, this picture shows in surface who are the biggest emitters. So China was a very big emitter. Of course, the United States are a big emitter. But we are amongst the 20% countries with the highest absolute emission. We are not a small country in that this sense at all, which we very often thought we were. And due to our court case now, everybody knows we are not small. But this is, of course, not very fair because here the, in China, there are more than a billion people and we only have 17 and a half million. So we're very small with an enormous amount of emissions. And therefore, it's much, much more fair to look at the emissions per person. And then we are in the top 10. We are not small at all. We have five times as high emissions as people in India. So it's very clear that uh, like in the, the last uh, COP in Glasgow, when people in India said, yeah, it's not very fair that if you all want to diminish your uh, emissions with 50% in 10 years time, then we are still having a situation in which the Netherlands have five times as much emissions as we do. So that uh, all the same percentage is just not fair. And, and I think that it's fully right that they say this. So our first uh, part of the court case was with the district court in The Hague, when we had all those citizens that were our co-plaintiffs. And the first part, I think a lot of people don't realize that was based on tort law, so civil law. We said it's an unlawful deed if you don't do what you need to do as a government to protect your citizens. And because we had this goal of 25 to 40%, and even in a very small time, we had a good government that says, well, if it's between 25 and 40, and we uh, we are such a big emitter, then we should do at least 30. 
And then we got a right wing government and they halved the goals. And that was the time when we thought now we need to step in. So we went to court and we we formalized, we said, well, it's unlawful if you create such a dangerous situation and you don't do something about it because you have a duty of care to protect your citizens. And that was new in the world that you could go to court. And the only reason why we could win this because it was hazardous negligence. So it was a very dangerous situation, which was agreed upon by all countries in the world based on science. And there are not many problems where you have all countries in the world based on science saying all together, this is such a big problem with such enormous consequences, which will happen quite surely. Um, and you have a very high risk because of course, after our court case, a lot of people say, now you can go to court for anything. Well, that's not true because there's not many things which have such a dangerous situation, which is agreed upon by everybody. And where you also have uh, declared yourself as a country, well, we need to do, uh, in this case, at least between 25 and 40 percent less emissions. So besides a duty of care, there was also a standard of care, which was those 25 to 40 percent. And of course, the state has discretionary power, so you can't do, um, you can't go to court for everything, but the, the judge does look at what is your duty of care and what's the lowest level, and that uh, is guarded by the judiciary. Well, then in 2015, so already three years after we started, the first court said, yeah, agenda is right. You have a duty of care. That's an open norm. And this is colored by everything that the, the Netherlands has said within the framework of the IPCC and of the, the what we said in Europe, we need to do about climate change and so on and so on. So we colored this norm by showing to the judges what the Netherlands had declared for the last 10 years it needed to do to protect its citizens. And that to, to frame this, and so, so to color this open norm, that was actually the new thing. Because of course you can say there is a duty of care, but you have to make clear what is this duty of care. So there was a standard of care, this 25 to 40% that was agreed upon with all countries in the framework of the Climate Change Convention. And it was agreed upon by the Netherlands in all kinds of documents. And that was the big work to make that shown to those judges. And the judges said, well, of course, the 40% that was our first demand is maybe necessary to tackle climate change, but that's up to the, the politicians. So that's this discretionary power, but this lowest level of 25%, I guard that as a judge. And that's what you need to do at least. Well, and then the, uh, our government went to the Court of Appeal and it had 29 grounds of appeal. So uh, everything that they could invent was brought in for the next court. And then we thought, well, OK, if we have to co go to the next court, then we have one ground of appeal ourselves. And we said, the first judge said, because agenda is a foundation and not a human, they cannot refer to the Convention on Human Rights. And we said, well, we might not be a human, so we might not be able to go to the court on human rights. But of course, we can uh, use the Convention on Human Rights and bring that in the procedure. And the second court said, yeah, agenda is right. Article 2 and 8 uh, on, of this convention are things that apply here. And because European law is of a higher order than the Dutch law, the duty of care is also based on this convention on human rights. And the standard of care stays the same, the 25 to 40% and therefore the 25%. And therefore at this point of time, we had kind of two legs to stand on, one on tort law and one in uh, human rights law. And of course, the, the Dutch government went to the highest court in the Netherlands, and we tried to use two legs. So in case the, the Supreme Court would say the, the Convention on Human Rights is not applicable here, we could still go back to tort law. 
well, this is a picture of all of us. We had a lot of young people. And the funny thing is, if you look at those people, this little girl, when we started in 2012, was really small. She was like four years old. And uh, my own children are were also in the room all the time. And you can see by looking at them how long the case took over all those uh, eight years. And then the 20th of December, so say 11 days before 2020 started, we finally won in the last court and the judgment was upheld. And of course, we were a bit worried when we knew the Supreme Court would somewhere at the end of 2019 give its final verdict that, the, that they would not dare to, uh, to say our agenda is right because it was kind of impossible thing to win. And that was the reason why we started before that with our so-called 55, uh, 54 solutions plan. And we offered that a uh, half year earlier to the government. These two gentlemen here are the highest uh, official persons of the Ministry of Economic Affairs and the highest uh, person under the Minister of the Ministry of Interior. Um, and we offered to those two highest officials together with 800 organizations this plan. So this first, it was a 40 uh, solutions plan and then we added 14 extra uh, say every month when they didn't act we added another one just to show also to the supreme court look uh, if you let us win we can still make it because we showed that by taking all these measures at the end you could still do almost 17 megaton of uh, less emissions within one year and that was what was needed to win the court case and we showed here you can do all kinds of small things like uh, put solar panels or change lights or all kinds of uh, ways you can reduce your energy use. But of course, you can also close down the coal-fired power plant plants. They are not in these lists, so it's an, a, choose, uh, a choice they had. So you could say, oh, we closed two, then we only had to do 20 measures, or you don't want to close any, then you have to do 54. But in any ways, we wanted to show it is still possible. And that was supported by those 800 organizations that also offered to help the government to carry out all those measures. So we also offered our support. And in, in the end, we did help with carrying out some of those measures. Well, in the end, after we won, they closed down one. There was a second one planned, but in the end, they didn't go through. And they, they took 30 of those 54 measures, which were carried out for roughly 3 billion euros. And we did uh, 10 of them. Um, and they said, well, if this is not enough and we don't make the 25%, we will do additional things. Well, due to COVID-19 in 2020, all emissions were down and they just made it. But then in 21, it went up again and they had about two megaton too much. And we had a, at that time, there was no government. So they were still uh, talking to each other. And they, the, this government in, uh, in transitions at least put another budget of almost 7 billion on the table for agenda to make our climate case. And then at the beginning of this year, we finally had after one year of talking a new government and they put down uh, 35 billion additionally for climate. So in the end, in total, it was almost 45 billion for climate, which we have never had. Usually it was a few, uh, well, well, if you were lucky, 100 million. So the, the court case did result in a lot of additional action, but quite late. Uh, and at the beginning of this year, when this new government was there, I spoke with the Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate and told him that last year there was two megaton too much. And we made the agreement that this year he would do at least 25% plus two megaton. And at this point of the year, you can see that, that this is uh, no problem. He will make that. And that's partly because of the war that's going on in Europe and the um, the, the energy prices that are so high that a lot of people are trying to save energy and a lot of uh, companies that use a lot of gas, which is very expensive here at the moment. And some of them have closed down, other have are on 10% of their production. So we are now on schedule. And actually, of course, they should be doing much more than our case because the, 
the case we had started in 2012 was still before Paris. And at that time, we tried to keep the warming below two degrees. And the 25 to 40% was for staying below two degrees. So 25% is the lowest level you needed to do for reaching two degrees, which of course is not enough at all. Well, so halfway our, our uh, court case, when we had, we had just won in June and at the end of 2015, there was Paris. And then we decided, well, two degrees is actually way too much. We should try to stay below 1.5 degrees. And I explained to um, our prime minister in my uh, speech with him last year, did, did, I asked him first, did you know what you signed? <laughs> because I was quite clear that he didn't know at all what he was signing. Well, because the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees is for a lot of people, well, nice degree more on the beach. But in climate terms, it's a lot of work to try to make that work. And I explained to him, look, if you know, if you look at the whole world and you view um, what is the carbon budget that is left before we, we will hit the 1.5 degrees, then we should, if you want to stay below 1.5 degrees with 66% chance, then you should stop emitting in 2033. And this is for the whole world, which is not very fair. And they have also made this for the Netherlands. Well, we should start stop uh, using um, coal, oil and gas in 2024 if we really want to stay seriously we want below 1.5 degrees. And so my most important message to him was actually based on this picture. Because I asked him, I said, do you know why you are telling people we have 30 years, be calm? The only reason why you can say this is because uh, when those people were negotiating in Paris, they knew that if they would say we have to go to zero in 2033, that it's politically impossible. So they asked the scientists, please find a solution. Well, I know the scientist who made this solution. And he now says, I wish I hadn't done this because it was the way out for politicians. Because what this says is we want to go down with the emissions and hit zero around 2050 and they don't tell you then that this is the, the, the this below this figure is all the emissions that's enough for 2.5 degrees warming and then we ask the young people this yellow field so-called negative emissions please try to get the co2 out of the air again and i asked our prime minister do you know what you have signed and what this means for young people because it's nice to draw uh, this yellow field, but what is it? And he had no clue, of course. And I told him, well, if you want to get CO2 out of the air, the cheapest thing to do is to plant trees. Do you know how many trees this is? He had no clue, of course. And I told him, well, this if you really want to realize this, then you need the surface of all agricultural land in the world, plant it with trees, let them stay there for 30 years, no fires or whatsoever, and then you have enough CO2 out of the air to go half a degree lower. So if this is enough for two and a half degrees and you plant so many trees, then you're only back to two degrees. In other words, in my view, this is an impossible solution for young people. This is, in my view, if I put it a bit stronger, it's immoral. The fact that we want to go on emitting until 2050, we should quit emitting much, much earlier in 2030, actually for the Netherlands, we should hit zero. And Urgenda has made th since 2012, three times a plan for the whole of the Netherlands, how we go would go to zero emissions within 10 years. So technically that's possible. There are all kinds of organizational problems and we don't feel the urgency enough yet, but it's not a technical problem. So at the end of my uh, meeting with him, I said, well, as agenda, we are more from the side of the solutions than, than that we want to go to court. So I have a solution for you. And I called, called it the woman on the moon plan. Like Kennedy, you said, I want to go to the moon within 10 years. I don't have the computers yet. I don't know which metals I have to use, but I want to be there in 10 years. And eight years later, we were on the moon. Well, I told our prime minister, I have visited 
all the biggest industries in the Netherlands and we have together made a plan how we could go to zero emissions within 10 years and what we need to do with steel, with chemicals, with fertilizers and so on. We need additional wind energy, we need to make hydrogen from it, etc. But this is impossible, with, this is possible within 10 years and all those biggest companies in the Netherlands want to do this. And then he got really enthusiastic, like, wow, and then we are Olympic champions of the industry. I said, yeah, you're an Olympic champion, whatever. And he invited me back two, year, two weeks later to discuss this in more detail. And this was around the period when he was still in discussion about the new government. And when the new government came, he had a plan with 35 billion euros for the industry and and the plan that's on the table is more or less what what's here written down uh it's only not called woman on the moon plan of course uh but that doesn't matter what he calls it at least we have now agreed already on this hydrogen uh hub and on additional wind on sea and he, they are now making individual uh, agreements with all the big companies in the netherlands so this is more or less really happening and I'm quite happy with that. And we also found uh, 10 uh, organizations of young people. And that's uh, also the young people from all political parties in the Netherlands, which went to their mother party and said, we want this because it's our future. And that helped a lot. Well, and as the agenda, we started after winning the court cases, also the so-called climate litigation network. So I have a couple of people working for our agenda that do nothing but helping cases in the rest of the world. So we won, for example, also the case in Ireland up to the Supreme Court. We put a lot of work in that. And the nice thing is that a lot of those cases are won by new and small NGOs. Like the Ireland uh, NGO that won this didn't even have a website when they started. We made their website. We helped them how to campaign, how to get people on the move, have a march through the city and so on. And what we know, what we see is that judges look at each other, uh, at least what they do here in, in Europe. But you see that they also have connections with people in Australia and in uh, United States. Of course, you cannot base your decisions on uh, decisions in other countries, but you can look at what's the general atmosphere. And you see that they are influencing each, each other. I was very happy both the French and the German case were not about 2020, but about 2030. And their line of reasoning was, if you have signed Paris and you know that the whole carbon budget is already used in 2030, then this is also a breach of human rights law of young people. And both the highest levels of courts in France and in Germany told their governments, you need to do more because you have signed Paris and the carbon budget is already used way too quickly. And you could see that the, in the case of the German uh, court case, uh, Angela Merkel was still in charge then. And within two weeks, she made uh, a new target for Germany. And that's, I think, the rule of law, that you really listen to your judges. So they were a lot quicker than in the Netherlands because it took five years before they finally took action. Uh, but in the end, they did but I was impressed by what happened uh, in Germany. So for us, we are very happily working on a major change within 10 years, zero emissions within 10 years. We have this plan of how to do it. And we are working in concrete projects on making houses and any neutral driving electrically, changing the industry and so on. And it's still possible, even if everybody thinks that it's not, I think we will have a lot of big disasters the coming 10 years that will help pushing together with all the young people in the world and all, all other people that are very worried. And I hope that uh, the ones in this room who are listening also belong to the crazy people that will make this happening. Thank you very much. I take my mic off for applause. Thank you, um, Mayan, for 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 taking us through that story. Um, and it is there are so many rich details that you shared with us. Let me reflect a few back that that stood with me, and then uh, Stefan will open it up into a 
into a group discussion. Um, so I, I think that it's always really interesting for me. Uh, I've only uh, been really fully committed as a climate activist for uh, a dozen or so years. And so I, I think I, there are always new people joining the global climate justice movement. Um, but I, I don't consider myself um, a newcomer. But I, I, you know, I, I think I came to it kind of late in, in existential terms. Uh, but I haven't been lucky enough as a filmmaker and journalist to do climate storytelling um, and, and connect with climate movements around the world. And one of the things that's always interesting when, when I connect with folks from the Netherlands um, is that you, you have some of the strongest cliches in global culture, like uh, windmills and bicycles uh, and dikes. And I think they obscure the fact for a lot of people that the Netherlands is a very significant per capita emitter. And we have, particularly in North America, we have an image of Scandinavian countries, of European countries as way ahead in some ways. And as a major oil and gas producing uh, exporter uh, like Canada that has uh, uh, overseen an escalation of emissions since 2015 when we switched governments and had a government that pledged uh, allegiance to climate action. Um, it's interesting for us to see the contradictions in other cultures as well. And, and I think this, you know, this image that people have of the Dutch all on their bicycles uh, riding past picturesque windmills, you know, does kind of give us a false sense. And so the work that you've done has really been an important corrective for us to understand the dynamics in the Netherlands. Uh, but there's other things that I've learned from, from, from being in the Netherlands where the political culture has some unique uh, features. For instance, the fact that you can get in the room with a sitting prime minister as a leading climate activist, and that you can work in a coalition with major industrial players, uh, as well as, as NGOs uh, and trade unions. There, there is a culture of consensus building and cross-sectoral collaboration in the Netherlands, I, I don't want to idealize it, but I think it it doesn't, you know, we don't have uh, that sort of dynamic in Canada. I know we all suffer from a lot of greenwashing these days. Um, you know, the big five banks in Canada have all made their net zero by 2050 pledges, and they're all frankly bullshit, uh, as those banks invest massively in fossil fuel projects, hundreds of billions of dollars worth. Um, and I know that you have the same. But what we don't have in Canada uh, and certainly they don't have in the United States, is a kind of political culture where it would be possible for, you know, a, a climate activist to sit down with the prime minister and do some direct climate education the way you have with your PM. I, I think that's pretty amazing. Um, and the fact that you uh, were able to, um, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic way to put this, but to create the sense that there was a parade he could get in front of to create the sense that there, you know, that that he could be excited by the political capital as he was trying to form a coalition government, the political capital and actual aggressive climate action and zero emissions in ten years and thirty five billion uh, euros in in a plan is, um, you know, that's that, that's probably not a dynamic that we could achieve in 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 Canada and a lot of countries around the world, but it's 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 a beautiful thing to consider. Um, because I think the Netherlands, frankly, is a country small enough that people kind of know each other. I mean, there's more people in the greater New York area than there are in the Netherlands. And, um, and, and you know, the, the, there's, there's a sense that people kind of are stuck together. There's a small town quality to the country um, that it might be possible for powerful figures in different sectors to actually look each other in the eye. And I do think that that, that, that kind of... Um, that accountability is really a signal feature of, of all of that work that you've done. A couple of other things I want to pull out on that theme. The notion that the lawsuit um, that you developed uh, a kind of a very flexible approach and, a, and an emerging approach throughout the journey, starting with civil law, but including human rights law, um, realizing halfway through the legal journey that they were going to say, the courts themselves were going to say, well, this can't be done, therefore we're not going to rule. And developing the plan while you're actually taking the government to court to prove to not just to the government, but to the court itself, that these kinds of rulings are, are incredibly practical. Uh, and that there, here is a plan on the table where we can achieve these emissions reductions. That's a very sophisticated kind of activist, legal uh, and, um, and political approach. That I think is is really instructive. Um, it's not enough just to hold them to account. 
you got to really lead them <laughs> when you're talking about the political class. Usually, and I say this as someone who embarrassingly has run for office myself, um, the political class, which is composed, as we know, of very vain and petty people. After all, who who wants to be a politician? It's 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 not the best among us, unfortunately, these days. And so being able to really lay out the path for your politicians, teach them in a room what is required and show them how much benefit it can be. That's that's an exciting uh, that's an exciting uh, prospect as well. And I think that, you know, the woman on the moon plan is just awesome for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but the fact that you can that you can get a politician who clearly doesn't get it and let and and invite them into the science and to the legal uh obligation and to the potential economic uh and social benefits and actually get them to embrace such an ambitious plan uh it may be out of our reach here uh but i think it's there's so, so many lessons in that that I, that i find really inspiring thank you so much for that talk thank you Mark, very much maybe react a little bit on it um I think a lot of people also didn't realize that the Netherlands is a very much a fossil fuel oriented country because we have the, the biggest natural gas hub of Europe, which is now coming to an end. But because we had this natural gas very cheap, we have a lot of industry here which could benefit from this cheap gas. So we, therefore, we have two big fertilizer companies here and we have a lot of chemical industry. We have two big harbors, the largest coal harbor of Europe, and therefore we also have a steel factory next to the coal harbor and so on. So I think even Dutch people didn't realize how much we were oriented towards uh, fossil fuels and that we had, yeah, we've become very big during the industrial revolution because of this. And the fact that we are so close to the sea will also help us the coming 20 years um, with climate change going on, because you could see this summer that a lot of rivers had hardly any water. So if you were depending on a river, you, you could not work. And here we are not depending on rivers because we have all our power plants close to the sea and that's helping us. Um, we do have um, a culture of uh, people knowing each other in this um, area. And I've been working in this field for more than 30 years. So I've also worked for governments uh, for six years. So some of the people that I worked with are now high in government levels and so on. So after 30 years, you know a lot of people. And I think I could not have done this when I was 30. Uh, the fact that I've been so long in the field and that people know me, they know that I have a lot of knowledge, that I never bullshit, that it's all always science-based and so on. Uh, and, and because we're also quite cooperative, so we didn't really fight and we didn't use knowledge that we had to make the government look very black. We were very supportive all the time. And that's also a reason then that when we finally won, we could have all those talks because I talked last year with the prime minister, but in the first year I talked with five other ministers and their highest level people. And I also demanded there to have uh, a 20 minute PowerPoints for all those high level people, because I thought if I can reach five ministries, the highest level people, including the ministers themselves, then you can really make a change because in politics, there's a lot of people without, uh, uh, we call it a beta background. So hardly any physicist of, or chemistry people or so on. And you need to know a bit more about that if you want to make decisions. And I wanted to well, convey a, kind of, a, a lot of things to make sure that they would not be lobbied too easily in the wrong direction. Um, and I still email them if I think they need to know something. And actually today there was a two pager in a big newspaper on what I think is necessary in new industry politics. And that you first need to determine what are the values based on which you make this politics, because you can throw money to all kinds of big companies to become green. But if we are going to drive electrically, we don't need half of the refineries. So why give them money to become green if you don't need them? And so on. And this was uh, a debate today in Parliament. And that, that, that was the reason that I wrote this article now. So we try to well, be part of the debate and, and show the direction and also show science-based that it is still possible to make all these changes. So if I can jump in here um, uh, just now, uh, I'd like to um, 
make a transition into a more um, sort of open-ended informal conversation uh, and open to everybody to ask questions or make comments. Uh, but before we do that, um, what I'll do is bring the formal part of the session to an end. Um, uh, and to do that, I just want to give a couple of reminders or a uh, heads up that um, when we finish here, we will be back in just under five hours uh, at 5 p.m. Pacific time today with Tony Aposa, the celebrated Philippine environmental lawyer and storyteller and the holder of the Normandy Chair for Peace. Uh, and then tomorrow we will have our final day of the Green Rights and Warrior Lawyers Academy with four back-to-back -back sessions starting at 7 a.m. Pacific um, featuring the American environmental human rights lawyer, uh, Stephen Donziger, and then South African uh, lawyer and earth jurisprudence pioneer, Cormac Cullinan, followed by the Nigerian environmental justice lawyer and uh, fellow uh, 2022 Goldman Prize winner, along with Marianne Minesma, Chima Williams. And finally, the Maori legal scholar, Jacinta Ruru. And there is still time to register for those if you haven't yet and you're interested by going to our website, which is bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Rawl Acad 22, G-R-A-W-L-A-C-A-D 22. And if you are a university student or you know a university student, please urge them uh, that it's also not too late to join in our innovative collaborative Green Rights and Warrior Lawyers Inspirathon, which is a kind of a researchathon and brainstorming activity that is open to university students anywhere in the world. And that concludes at the end of this month, uh, November 30th. Details are on the same uh, website. So at this point, um, we can stop the recording.